Hi there, welcome. Today's class is going to be workshop style. So please grab pen and paper for a couple of the exercises that we're going to do together. And to kick this off, I encourage you to pause and to consider what brings you to this class on mental fitness? What do you want more of in your life or less of? You can use any of my prompts here or write something entirely different, but I invite you to pause, consider, and write this down. And I want you to remember too that because this class is recorded, you can pause at any time you need more time to um, consider something that's being discussed here. Hopefully you have in your mind what it is you're after today. So I'm happy to be with you. I'm Wendy Reed and I'm a certified professional coach. I have recently begun integrating positive intelligence and embodiment coaching techniques into my client practice. Embodiment coaching is coaching that brings in the whole body and its side of the story to the table. And we're gonna to touch on some of that today, uh, as well as of course the positive intelligence work, which is uh, akin to mental fitness. All of my coaching training is designed to help clients work through their stuck places and grow through them to reach their goals. Most recently, I have also begun leading small groups of adults and teens through the seven week positive intelligence program, which is an in-depth mental fitness course from which the concepts in today's course have been pulled. So if you're not familiar with coaching itself, it is a relationship that's designed for individuals who are ready to do the work to get to the other side of a goal. You hire a coach when you're craving something more, something different. You want to take your life up a notch. You're stuck for some unknown reason. It could be that you're desiring a greater balance or you have a health goal. You want better performance at work. You want to see a better version of yourself show up in relationships. Maybe there's a life goal you've wanted to attain. Coaches like me can be a partner to you in that and help you move more quickly with some accountability and with greater personal insight so you can get where you want to go. So what is mental fitness? Let's get on the same page. The definition I'm supplying here was created by Shirzad Shamin. He's author of the New York Times bestselling book, Positive Intelligence. He uses the terms mental fitness and positive intelligence interchangeably, defining them as a measure of our capacity to access a positive mental mindset over a negative mental mindset more often than not in the face of life's challenges. Put more simply, mental fitness is a measure of the strength of your positive mental muscles versus your negative mental muscles. We can literally grow the positive and shrink the negative in a way that is measurable in your brains under an MRI after just six to eight weeks of doing certain mental fitness exercises. So I invite you to think of it like this. If you're not physically fit, you'd feel physical stress as you climb a steep hill. If you're not mentally fit, you'd feel mental stress, such as anxiety, frustration, unhappiness, as you handle work and relationship challenges and process events around you. And of course, the bonus of doing uh, the growth around these mental muscles is you get better relationships, you get greater peace of mind, and peak performance. You get to see yourself reach your potential. The concepts this three-part series are built on were built on years of research done in the fields of positive psychology, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and performance science, as well as research done at Stanford, specifically on how our brains process and react to stressful situations. There are also elements of emotional intelligence, which you may be familiar with, and mindfulness that are built into this approach. The research has been tested and the concepts have been honed by using it with hundreds of CEOs and their executive teams, using it with Stanford students, with world-class athletes, 
and with now half a million participants from 50 countries. And what I think is important about the fact that it's been with just so many people, but also from 50 countries, is that uh, this is not something that just works with, say, the American mind or culture. This is something that is human-based. It works for every single human based on how our minds uh, develop. So today is one of three classes designed to help you begin lifting some weights in the mental fitness gym, if you will. The way I've broken it down is by the three core mental muscles identified through research to be at the root of mental fitness. We're gonna delve into the first core muscle today, the negativity or saboteur interceptor muscle. Building any of these three muscles can make a positive difference for you, but it is the combination of the three that packs the most punch. And as innocent as this slide looks, what you are seeing here is a system that radically simplifies the path to get to this capacity to achieve a positive mental mindset more often. And as I'm sure you all know, there's a ton of literature and approaches out there on positivity that typically entail a lot of moving parts to remember. This makes all of that easier to remember and to act on. The goals for today are to begin to shift your relationship with patterned negativity. We're going to call that, that patterned negativity saboteurs to help you recognize and to weaken your number one saboteur, the universal human saboteur. And finally, to leave you some initial steps that hopefully will lighten your mental load and reduce some obstacles on the road to positivity for you. I also want to uh, impress upon you that the concepts that we're doing here and the fact that you're getting introduced to them for the first time and we'll be practicing them on a small scale doesn't mean that they can't add up to big things. I want you to think of it just like you go to a gym, you start with small weights, you get results. You can get some pretty big results just by lifting small weights. And that also goes along with mental fitness. So what you're learning here today can prepare you also for the bigger challenges of life. I also encourage you to listen with an open mind to what we will cover today. You might find, might find yourself reacting and defending your way of tackling life, and that is, of course, okay. I also hope you will play with the concepts here and see if perhaps they can bring you a more positive experience of your life as you're tackling it. Okay, so we're going to begin, begin here with an exercise that's designed to have you step into an assortment of emotions and explore there a little bit. This is a chance for your pen and paper to be out in front of you. What I'd like you to do is write down the numbers one through five and then write down a situation or an interaction that can consistently create each of those five emotions here for you. Feeling happy, stressed or anxious, angry or irritable, fearful, and sad. And I have supplied my own examples here uh, just to make it maybe a little more, uh, a little easier for you. So for me, what consistently, what situation can consistently make me feel happy is hopping in bed with a good book. Stressed or anxious, when I have an important public deadline where people are counting on me. Angry or irritable, when I see behavior that I think is mean or cruel. Fearful, imagining something bad happening to one of my family members. And finally, sad, when I read news about, quote, the world. Okay, what is it for you? This is a good chance for you to pause the recording here, restart when you have your answers down. This should take you no more than a minute or two. Now I'd like you to choose just one of those emotions to explore a little further. For example purposes, I picked stressed and anxious with an important public deadline. Do you have yours selected? Let's take a closer look at the emotional dynamic of just one of these emotions and the situation that brings it on. What circumstances 
triggered that feeling of, in my case, stress or anxiety. Here's my example. The desire to get it right, to not fail, to look good, my fear of letting others down. You may notice that what triggered the feeling of stress and anxiety wasn't the deadline itself, right? It's these things. What body sensations come with it? Fast heart rate, shortness of breath, tight chest, back, and neck muscles. You'd think I need a, a doctor for some of this. Uh, furrowed brow, a pit in my stomach. What is your internal dialogue or self-talk? in this situation or interaction. For me, important public deadline, when I'm, I've got my saboteurs in tow and the stress and anxieties on the, on the rise, I'm saying things to myself like, who do you think you are? Why did you agree to this? This is hard. Maybe I should just organize my office instead. And that one there, that's the avoider, which I, um, is, a, is a particular one of the, the saboteurs that I will go into in just a small amount of detail um, later. Okay, so I'd like you to complete this for yourself. This is where you will pause it. And um, it should take you just, you know, one to two minutes. Okay, go. All right. How was that for you? What are some of your key takeaways so far just from doing this, this exercise? For myself, uh, my big surprises were that the circumstances that triggered my stress weren't about the situation, really. They were about my mind tripping me up. How about for you? So for most of us, we take it for granted that negative emotions are par for the course, and we may then believe that there's little that we can do about them anyway. Actually, while negative emotions are, of course, natural and unavoidable, we can ask the question, are they good for us? Let me ask you this, is pain good for you? Absolutely. It is good for you. If we didn't have pain when we touched a hot stove, we might keep it there far too long and suffer the consequences. But how long is long enough to get the signal that something is wrong and feels threatening to us, physically or emotionally? Emotions like anger, stress, disappointment, frustration, guilt, they all send a signal right away. They're good for that because they tell us something feels wrong and something needs to be done about it. But truth be told, we don't need more than a second of those negative feelings to get the message and realize that something needs our attention. The trouble is, most of us have a tendency to keep our hands on the hot stove of emotions unconsciously with consequences that are not too different from burning our hands on the stove. For example, damaged relationships, damaged sense of self, lost time and productivity, burned out willpower, even health impacts related to extended stress. To be clear, negative emotions are totally normal, but outside of grief, they're only good for us as an alert signal, period. When we stay in anger, frustration, self-criticism, other criticism, even sadness, and more, we limit our options from there. We literally cannot see our way to a more positive mindset because our survival brain is still on red alert. When we act from negative emotions like disappointment, shame, or guilt, this produces unintended, typically unwanted, emotions, I'm sorry, unwanted outcomes. So I want you, I know this is probably hard to take in a little bit, but negative emotions equal a saboteur. 
And I suspect it's hard to take in because I know it was for me when I first heard this. Uh, we tend to rely on our negative thought patterns to motivate us. But I really want you to invite in the possibility that every negative emotion keeps you in sabotage mode. When we let some negative emotions off the hook, it becomes this slippery slope. And the next thing you know, you're letting them rule the roost again. So where do we want to be instead? We want to be in a different part of our brain that has access to calm, clear-headed action, creativity, curiosity, purpose, and more. I want you to think of Yoda here and his uh, Star Wars Jedi mind training. Let's say he was being attacked by six different enemies coming from six different directions. We know what he would do. He would shift into a calm, into calm, clear-headed focus and action, and he would take down each opponent with ease. If he stayed upset by the attack itself, and it was like, why are you attacking me? Hey, I trained that guy. I, I, I thought he was a friend. And he let a cascade of emotions follow from there. He'd have let a negative emotional response distract and hijack him. Not useful. Of course, this example can only happen with high mental fitness and in a galaxy far, far away. So by the way, I really do like this quote. Um, and I think it's important to note that every single saboteur that we're going to talk about is fear-based. Fears like fear of separation, fear of failure, fear of not being loved, fear of, of risk. I'll read the quote. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. So negative emotions operate out of one side of our brain, the survival brain, which is why they are always first on the scene in a situation that feels threatening. The saboteur brain is made up of our brainstem, limbic system, and parts of our left brain. Our sage brain, which I also like to call our thrive brain, it's made up of our middle prefrontal cortex, parts of our right brain, and our empathy circuitry. So we're talking about two different organs that produce very different responses and feelings. Shirzad Shamin and his team at Stanford broke our negative reactions down into 10 saboteur types to help people see their own patterns more clearly. They also identified five sage powers we can all employ that can give us access to more positivity and perspective. We'll also explore those in the third class. So you may be thinking, you've been pretty successful in life. So there's no way you've been bogged down by saboteurs. Maybe true, but it's important to know also that saboteurs can generate success. They just can't generate sustained happiness. Lots of CEOs, for instance, are highly successful, but few are deeply happy. They're constantly waiting to see if they will perform well. With happiness designed I'm sorry, defined for them as the promise out there of greater achievement. Peak performance actually comes from the sage brain and it produces sustained happiness when it's generated from there. So a big part of our being able to thrive in life is determined by how quickly we can shift from reacting and living out of this unconscious, knee-jerk survival brain into our sage brain that takes in this bigger picture and it acts deliberately. For example, being able to shift from getting irritable and impatient at what always prompts that kind of response from us to pausing, noticing the negative emotion is there and thoughtfully considering the situation and maybe even getting curious. The first step to making this shift is noticing when you're operating out of one or the other parts of your brain. And that can be tricky because the saboteur brain's operations aren't so conscious, making it harder to see 
But that is why the saboteur personas were developed to turn the light on and reveal the patterns more clearly. And here's the good news. We do not tend to sabotage ourselves in 50 different ways. There are just 10 saboteurs in total and most of us only have a few of them. The number one saboteur is called the judge. This is the universal human saboteur. It is driving the entire saboteur train. Every single human has the judge to some extent, just based on how our brains were formed to survive. And I promise you, you have it. I know I do. We're gonna go into some depth on it um, in just a minute. And then there are nine accomplice saboteurs. And on paper, some of these saboteurs might even sound positive to you, like the hyperachiever, the pleaser. But because they show up when there's a perceived threat, big or small, they each sizably limit how we interpret and handle challenges how we relate to others and to ourselves, how happy we are even during the challenge at hand and how happy we are afterwards. So I'm gonna read a few here and describe just a couple. The controller with the fear of being out of control holds tight to a need to control, especially under stress. The hyperachiever driven to achieve, 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 constantly fearing failure, unable to savor, savor success for more than a minute or two. The restless saboteur, always busy, 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 on to the next activity, unable to enjoy and appreciate the present moment, the people they're with or the place they're in. The stickler, with a need for order and perfection taken too far, often feels like, they often feel like they have to do it themselves to get it done right. This one brings up memories of childhood for me because my mother who identifies with the stickler saboteur, she used to angry vacuum because no one in the house cleaned the house the way that it needed to be done. And I remember the feeling of being in her presence when she was angry vacuuming. It was not a good feeling. The pleaser, always in service to keep people liking them and feeling resentful when the giving is not reciprocated or appreciated, and so on. There's the hypervigilant, there's the avoider, the victim, the hyperrational. And before you start shaming yourself by judging your judge and judging the saboteurs that you might have already started to relate to, let's just be clear that our saboteurs, they are not us, and they are not our personality. We are not broken. They are an old set of defense mechanisms that we can recognize and get rid of simply by noticing them and weakening them. All right, so let's explore the judge. The judge saboteur is characterized by finding fault with self, with others, and with circumstances or outcomes. You may be familiar with the concept of the inner critic. The judge incorporates this concept and adds two other modalities, critiquing others and critiquing circumstances. For judging the self, the way it does this is it badgers us for past mistakes we've made, for coming up short now. It judges others, noticing what is wrong about them rather than being able to find something to appreciate. This one plays the comparison game, inferior superior comparisons. Judging circumstances. This judge insists that certain circumstances or outcomes are bad without even entertaining the possibility of looking at it in a more positive way. This one causes conditional happiness. I'll be happy when I get that job, when the pandemic ends, when life gets back to normal. I'd be happier if I'd held on to that last job, if I hadn't moved to this area. Perhaps you're starting to uh, see some things that you've noticed in yourself. So what does the judge sound like? Generally in a nutshell, sounds like the thoughts. What is wrong with me? Something is wrong with you. This situation is bad. You know the judge is there when you have feelings of shame, disappointment, regret, 
guilt, anger, so much of our mental suffering is because of this character. This is the one that keeps us up at night. Much of our anger and anxiety is instigated by the judge. I also want to pause for a moment. We've begun exploring this already, but it's important to recognize that our feelings live more in our body than in our minds. We perceive them more here. Perhaps, like with the exercise we did at the beginning, you can start to feel what it's like in your body when the judge is on the scene for you. Okay, I invite you to do that. So every saboteur justifies its existence with its own set of lies, which is why we sometimes come to their defense because we believe their lies. Most people think their judge is their voice of reason, a solid protector and an advocate and their best motivator. Here are just a few of the judge's lies. Without me pushing you, you will get lazy and complacent, soft. Without me punishing you for mistakes, you will not learn from them and you will repeat them. Without me scaring you about future outcomes, you will not work hard to prevent them. Without me judging others, you're gonna lose your, your objectivity and not protect your self-interest. Without me making you feel bad about yourself, you won't do anything to change it. Not so nice, huh? Doesn't feel so good to just hear those. So when we let the judge lead us through stressful situations and challenges, we get anxiety, distress, and suffering. We get conflict. With me judging you and finding you lacking and you judging me right back. And the judge's perspective of bad things are afoot invites in the other saboteurs. For example, if I judge myself as unequipped, as doomed to fail around my important public deadline, my avoider might kick in and distract me with other projects. So I don't have to face the pain of doing the project that my judge thinks I'm going to fail at. Okay, so we're gonna do a four minute contemplation to help you get a sense of your judge's presence and its current strength in each of the three modalities. Before we begin, though, we're going to start with some sensory focus repetitions, giving you a small preview of what we'll do in the second class. So we're going to get ourselves present. I invite you to get comfortable in your seat. You can keep your eyes open or close them. I want you to feel the weight of your body on your seat. The weight of your feet on the floor. Now I want you to rub two fingers together with such attention, you can feel the ridges of your fingertips meet. Focus only on the sensation of touch. Okay, I want you to notice your breath now. Place a hand on your belly and feel the rise and fall of your stomach against your hand with each breath. Okay, now we're going to do a brief contemplation. And we're gonna have you consider where you are right now with your judge. You can close your eyes and, or open them during any portion of this, whatever serves you. So what you'll be doing is giving yourself a zero to 10 score against each of the judge's modalities, judging self, judging others, and judging circumstances. With 10 being incredibly high, strong judge, and zero low for strength. Okay, so here we go. 
scanning over the events and the outcomes of the last few weeks or even months. What score would you give yourself as an average score right now in terms of how strong your judging of self is? The judge might feel like regret, shame, guilt, self-doubt, unworthiness, or coming up short in some way. Zero to 10, with 10 being incredibly strong. And when you're ready, write down your number. Next, how strong would you say your judge of others is? This judge might feel like judging others as better or worse than you in some way, as others coming up short against how you think they should act, be, believe, look, as getting angry or irritable with others. And as you scan for this, notice who is typically the subject of your judgment. Okay, zero to 10, write it down. Okay, finally, what is the strength of your judge of situations and circumstances of your life? On waiting for it all to change so you'll be happy one day or calm? Judging that you can't be happy under these circumstances when this is going on. How much is your current life unworthy of happiness and your perspective rooted in, I'll be happy when? Okay, zero to 10, write it down. I invite you to just take a moment to contemplate this exercise. What did you notice? What might be an emerging insight? Is there anything becoming clear? Is there one thing you just want to make sure you remember? If so, please write it down. So when I did a similar exercise, I learned that my top dog judge was my situational judge. And this surprised me. It did not surprise my family as it turns out. Uh, so the impact that my situational judge was having on my family life was big apparently. My daughter was sensitive to my moods and my body language, especially when I looked at my phone, burrowed my brow, shook my head, and sighed. What's wrong, mommy? She would ask me. My answer, to myself only, the world is going to heck in a handbasket. This judge saboteur, which I am currently calling mountain man because he makes any stressful input or challenge as big as a mountain, hairier, scarier. This guy was having a cascade effect in my life. My family was tiptoeing around me when I read the news and my mood would go downhill. It was affecting my work too because it hit at my faith that things could get better. That's a heavy load to carry around, and it's not a good feeling knowing that I was passing it along. How about you? What are you noticing so far? I invite you to write this down. Just write down body sensations, 
with a question mark on your paper and just consider eat after today's workshop how your strongest judge modality shows up in your body and your mannerisms your energy so you started exploring your judge in detail i encourage you to take the saboteur assessment quiz it's free at positiveintelligence.com to learn what your top saboteurs are as well uh, based on the research done to identify these persona patterns it's a guarantee that you will find yourself with at least one of them resonating for you the goal is to reduce the impact of just the top saboteurs by noticing and naming them during even small stressful situations an important disclaimer though it can be tempting to start assigning saboteurs to our partners and to our friends let's not go there the best results you're going to see and get are going to come from reducing the influence of these characters on your own life in your own mind when you can do that you will automatically interrupt relationship patterns that have counted on two saboteurs in the fighting ring in the past if you do take the assessment this is part of what you will get you'll get to see the saboteurs ranked from top to bottom you won't see the judge here because we all know the judge is always there at the top so and the goal here is you focus on just the top couple of them if you focus on weakening those you actually weaken the rest of them as part of the report you get to see the characteristics and some of the lies and thoughts that come with this particular uh, uh saboteur and you can see you know some some it's gonna it's gonna resonate right away some would be like no that's not me notice what does resonate because that can act as like a a wanted poster for a criminal you can catch that criminal faster because you recognize it when you see it in action so what we're doing here is illuminating patterns that have been with you for a long time while they may shift some over time, for the most part, they're consistent. Whether you call them out by the saboteur names that I've introduced you to today or not, when it comes to the impact of small and big stressors in your life, your mind and your body respond very consistently. And recognizing and weakening these consistent responses in the small places helps you prepare for bigger challenges later. So their presence is signaled by body sensations that come on even before the thoughts have hit your brain. Maybe it's a drop in your stomach, a dip in your energy, or an intense surge in your energy. Perhaps there's a cool edge around you. Negative energy that you can feel inside of you. Maybe others can sense too. Self-talk. You begin noticing you're coming down hard on yourself or on someone else. Maybe you're rolling the same thoughts around over and over again. Maybe your perspective has become rigid and polarized with no gray area allowed. Perhaps you feel like you just have to push yourself, push yourself through a project or task using the whip. This is how you know they're there. Okay, so let's recap the process here and the overarching idea. The less time we spend with our hand on the hot stove of negativity, the better. You can intercept negativity by noticing the signs, the sensations that come with it and that familiar self-talk. Naming what's really going on, how you really feel. We can weaken the hold of the saboteur like we would ward off a vampire, if you remember what one of the ways that you can do that, by bringing it into the light. Doing this alone diffuses its intensity. For example, you might notice your heart rate is up or there's a pit in your stomach and ask, hmm, what's going on here? Oh, I'm feeling stressed about the deadline. I'm feeling unappreciated. 
I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling sad. From there, show that excess negativity the door. You have got the situation in play and now that it's in the light. And then finally, you can redu redirect your mind and body to keep yourself, you know, get that hand off of that stove, right? How do you do it? You redirect. Where focus goes, energy flows. This is, quite frankly, this is the key to it all. Redirecting your focus and training your mind to do that again and again and again is the answer. Where focus goes, energy flows. So what that means essentially is if we're focused on negativity, 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 guess where your energy is. Guess where your efforts are. They're still in that space, right? As soon as you pull your focus out and you go into that other direction, so much more is possible. And that is where your energy is directed. I'm going to give you a few ways to redirect your energy. The first thing you can do, especially when you're, you're really feeling it, you're in the thick of it, do a sensory focus exercise. We just started to do one of those, right? With the 10, just doing 10 seconds of rubbing two fingers together. Just focused on the sense of touch. That's all you're focused on. If you lose your focus for a moment, no big deal. Just bring it back to the sense of touch. Practice empathy. This is a great way to redirect and it also turns that sage brain on. We can be so hard on ourselves. If we're feeling irritable, stressed, out of sorts, then we're suffering. Give yourself a moment. Acknowledge how you're feeling. You deserve it. One way you can be gentle to yourself is to breathe into tense areas. So for example, if your, tummock, your stomach is feeling tense, placing a gentle hand on it and breathing with your focus on your belly can help. You can do this if, let's say your shoulders are tight. You can put your hands up here, just focus there. Breathe into that tension. Be, be kind to yourself. Move, get into motion. This can just be a stretch, a wiggle, a little jiggy you do with some music. It can be exercise of some kind that you enjoy. Move. Reach out beyond yourself. Another of my favorite quotes is, the mind is a dangerous place. Don't go there alone. Reach out, give in some way. Connect with someone. Maybe send a text or pick up the phone. Let somebody know you're thinking about them. Find something to appreciate or someone to appreciate and express it or write it down. Get outside. Nature is the gift that keeps on giving and it is proven to reduce our cortisol associated with stress and even a few minutes helps. So get outside just for a couple of minutes if that's all you have. The ultimate redirect in those really tough situations is applying the sage perspective. So you want to check out the class on engaging your sage for how to do this, but feel free to try it out immediately. The perspective here is that every situation or outcome can be turned into a gift or opportunity. Essentially, life is a treasure hunt and there is treasure in every situation. Dig for it. You will find it. Okay, so now if this were a coaching session, I know it's not, but if it were, uh, I would invite you to commit to a few things for homework over the next week or two between sessions to help you move forward against the goal that you came into the session for. So this is your time to revisit. Why did you show up today? What did you write down? What is one thing you could do? What is one thing you could commit to doing that would move you forward against that goal of being maybe calmer, having a little less stress. 
Is there something you could apply from today's class? I want you to think about it for just a moment. Maybe it's doing the little uh, rubbing the, the, the fingers together, sensory focus exercise when you're feeling stressed. Just that one thing. Maybe it's going outside for just one minute a day. Maybe it's picking out a favorite song that just makes you so happy when you hear it and making it, putting it in a way that you can access it in a, at a moment's notice and play it and wiggle a little bit. Maybe dance. What is that one thing? My invitation to you is to begin noticing your body sensations and your self-talk related to your judge. And maybe that'll be just the judge modality that you found to be the strongest. Like for me, I put a lot of my efforts into weakening my situational judge. It has made, it has been life-changing. I please invite you to pick your strongest modality. Begin noticing the sensations and the self-talk. Practice the pivot. Notice it, name it, what's going on here, and redirect. It can be just, the redirect can just be this. And then finally, take the saboteur quiz. It, I think it's fascinating. It'll be interesting for you, I, I believe. And see what you find there. And remember, don't bring your judge to the table for that. Thank you so much for being in this class today. I hope it has served you in some meaningful way. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, whether it's about coaching or mental fitness, uh, about the content of today's class at wendyreadcoaching at gmail.com. I will also invite you, if you or somebody you care about, you believe that they might benefit from coaching, I do offer a free uh, consultation, a free coaching session to just try it on. There's, it's a no strings attached opportunity that one can take advantage of. Please reach out to me if that appeals. Um, and my website is wendyreadcoaching.com. Thank you again, and I hope to see you in the next class.